guys, I'm Mike Brill, the homeless man who uh, founded and runs and kind of moves the gauntlet along. I am here with Alaric Kupsovich. Hello. Who is the DM for the first gauntlet, uh, the Bastion of Thrym. Today on Ask a DM, we're just going to go into the different facets and things that kind of build up what DMing is to kind of help all you guys out uh, when you are doing your own campaigns in general. So, hello, Eric. Hello, again. Hi, thank you for <laughs> joining me. Um, to kind of start off, why DM? Why do you like DMing? Well, DMing is a very different kind of experience than playing. Because playing Dungeons and Dragons, you're a single character and you're kind of determining the story of that character uh, and making choices and just experiencing options in a way that is like very centered around that one person. When you're a DM, you're more akin to an author really because you're developing a vast array of characters at the same time and it's kind of your job to keep the pacing right, keep the narrative right, uh, keep the feel like, like above and everything else a good session relies on a good DM and while those are maybe reasons to not DM if you feel confident in it, it is a way in my opinion a more rewarding experience because you get to see immediate feedback on how it, how your event went um I personally like, and well, a big facet I like is that you get to play all the NPCs. So, whenever you have a cool idea for a character, rather than make your, let's say, seventh character sheet, uh, you can play that NPC, have them interact with the party, find out in like a session or two that, yeah, this guy has a fun idea, but I couldn't play him to level him up. Then you can just move him on. So, it lets you experiment a lot more but at the same time, playing a lot more. All right. So kind of a follow-up on that sure. with uh, just DMing and how uh, some people might get into it. Is there, like, steps or early advice for early DMs mm. that you would give? Um, I mean, officially there are adventure modules, which is like a predetermined adventure that you can run, and that's maybe easier for a beginning DM. Um, I don't know that I would always recommend that because they are the different DMs of different styles, and adventure modules are almost always geared towards the fight driven DM. So I personally am a DM who prefers political intrigue and uh, like maneuvering over yes you do <laughs> over a straight up dungeon crawl um and that's that's a lot harder to find a module for uh but at the same time creating a world and creating an avenger is probably the most daunting task to a new dm so i definitely get why people would use them and if you are a new dm who feel like that is the biggest danger for you and where you're least sure of yourself if you think you can run a uh, touch and fine but you're not sure how to make one that's a great tool. Um, my advice, if you are going to make your own adventures, don't be afraid to start small. If you're playing a adventure for first level characters, it's completely fine if your job is go eliminate the rats in the sewers or go hunt down these bandits that just robbed an inn. It's very, very basic stuff, but while you're also new to DMing, chances are at least one of your players is new to playing. And so to have that balance lets them get comfortable with their characters and you get comfortable with your job. And then once you're all more familiar with what you want to do, then you pull out that secret story idea you've been all excited about and made you want to start DMing in the first place. Are and this is an oddly phrased question, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna try my best because I know multiple people have uh, kind of brought it up, especially mm -hmm. in terms with the gauntlet, and we yes. will get to that in a moment. Oh sure. But 
What makes a strong encounter of some kind of monster than a weak mm. encounter? What is the kind of complexities that make a good one versus a bad one? Okay. Um, I would say the biggest thing that makes that worth a good encounter out from a bad encounter is a element of discovery and strategy. So... You can definitely do the, you walk into a room, there's four orcs in the room around a campfire, they leap up, grab their weapons, and attack. That's not a super exciting encounter. I mean, you can definitely get a lot of mileage out of that, because people like to fight monsters, they like to be evils, they like to get loot, and that provide, is all provided in the encounter I just described. But what I find a good encounter is, is if there is some aspect of either the monster or the environment or even something outside of the encounter itself that puts a little extra spin or a twist on it. So if uh, maybe there's a trap somewhere in the room that the orcs will kind of try and guide the party to, like one of them will kind of move to the side and start firing arrows because he's like standing in front of a pit trap or something like that. So if the party charges him, they'll just fall into the trap. Something where, or or differently, some monsters already provide this, so like a Remoraz has that little lava blood. That's a nice little trick that the party can be like, oh, this is a straightforward fight. Oh wait, no it's not. This thing has lava blood. We need to strategize and attack it with range. So, if a good encounter will make the party think and plan more than just, well, I'll roll this now and hope I get high. Is my my criteria. I don't think people have different criteria, and that's completely fine. But that's how I view a good encounter. Alright, well, actually, I, I know this wasn't in the original questions, but mm-hmm. I'm going to ask it just because I sure. know people have asked me this. Sure. And I'm not the person to ask on this. What makes a good trap? Because okay. I have a lot of DM people who have asked me, since I have also used traps, what makes a good trap? Traps are hard. Yeah, Because man. To, a logically placed trap has absolutely nothing to tell you that there should be a trap there. So if you, want, if you are designing a trap to be the best trap possible, you should put it in the middle of an empty corridor with nothing around. But the moment you do that, your party immediately stops everything and starts testing every 10 feet of floor along the corridor and everything just slows down to a stupid slow pace so that's why you had zombies (laughs) no quiet you (laughs) um but no so in my opinion a trap is best if there is either a some warning or b some significance you basically want your party to be like Oh, yeah, we should have seen that coming, not what the heck, how are we supposed to see that coming? Yeah. Um, I prefer my traps to be non-lethal, more like a, a, a trap that will soften up the party for whatever's next. Or if they just got done a fight and they're pretty low, maybe it'll be lethal then, but that's their own fault for not resting before they looted the room. <laughs> or searching for traps. Like, if you're on one hit point, you don't go walk up to that ornately carved chest and just be like, "Oh yeah, every, everything will be fine." That's that's how you get killed with an arrow trap or a poison dagger or things like that. Or, or if you're new, a, a mimic. Uh, I don't. I don't like mimics everywhere because no, mimic is a. I, isn't that a once a campaign? You've got it like once a campaign, yeah. or or if you do it twice, you have to basically be like referencing the first time you use it. Yeah, and hope that your party doesn't get fall for it twice because then they'll just get mad at you and they won't trust you ever again. Yeah, there's a certain level of trust with the DM that they won't just make stupid things. So this is actually I'm going to pull into a separate topic. This is kind of a shift in the way DMing has been run. Back when D and D was first created. The DM almost was the enemy. Their job was to be fair, but at the same time, there was also this idea of, but also see how many characters they can kill. Yeah, rocks fall, everybody dies. Sure. It was also perfectly acceptable to have a room that turned into a, like a corridor that just turned into a dead end, 
that would drop a porticlis behind you and just trap you in a, just a metal bars and a dead end with no way out. And your people have to either break through the metal bars, good luck with that, or the wall, or they starve. And that was considered perfectly fine DMing. Uh, more recently, we've shifted to a more story-driven uh, adventure format. And so DMs are more expected to provide a way out. So like, if you were to do that now, you would probably, like your players, not necessarily would expect, but like a good DM now would provide either some secret door out of the t corridor or maybe some monsters would come and take prisoner people that fell in their trap rather than just being like, oh, you failed to think of this one problem. Now you die. So there is a certain amount of trust that players have in DMs now that can get abused and often does. Uh, but at the fundamental level, you, you as a DM do want to make sure your players are having fun. So that kind of leads, uh, interestingly, into the next question that I kind of have, which mm -hmm. is the gauntlet. Yeah. A the opposite of what I just said. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it, how, do you, how do you make that balance? Because the point of the gauntlet mm -hmm. is to be an unflinching kind of look you in the eye and not look away kind of... Oh, almost a Herculean kind of, uh, <laughs> like, labors that you have to go through. Um, so how do you as a DM go, this is a good challenge and a serious challenge that is lethal and deadly and will kill players mm -hmm. and at the same time will not be broken? Okay. So And you're not the enemy. Right. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the gauntlet is more old school D and D than a lot of D and D is now. In that, it is an adventure where a perfectly acceptable conclusion is everybody dies. Not rocks fall, everybody dies, but rocks fall, one person dies, is not unbelievable. Um, you try to be more creative than that. Though. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically. When I'm designing the gauntlet, or a ga the gauntlet, I've only done one. Uh, I'll do another one soon, don't worry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, when I'm designing the gauntlet, what I look for is ways that a player's death can still feel cinematic or story-driven. So... I look for ways to create an encounter or a trap or a, just a dungeon occurrence where a player's death feels dramatic and appropriate, not just random. So encounters like the Remoras, it makes sense if that giant centipede does eat somebody, but at the same time, I figured they probably would be able to handle it because it is the first encounter, so they're rested up, they're completely fresh. Um, if they had just died to those hobgoblins, that would have been a little less dramatic. That's why I threw in the Winter Wolves, which are a much tougher monster than I think they realized, and uh, that almost led to some problems. But basically, you want to set up the adventure in such a way that it feels appropriate that players could die. You don't want it to feel surprising and out of the blue. By the way, mm -hmm. well, I'm changing the name of this podcast in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> it is now going to be called A Short Rest. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> I I deemed that a short rest with a DM. Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm so so you have kind of these encounters with the gauntlet. Um kind of last couple of things here. Sure. <laughs> kind of one serious and then two jokes. Mm -hmm. Um two jokes, hopefully. So the first serious question that I actually have, sure. well, not the first serious question that I have, but out of the three, 
Um, w- when it comes to a player going into a gauntlet, mm-hmm. because I know uh, they kind of there, there's mixed expectation, and there should be considering yes. the fact that it's a new DM every time. Yes. Um, not every time, but we do have a rotating. We, oh cast yes, of we, DMs. we yes. we move it around. Um, so, what? kind of advice would you have for players who want to be in the gauntlet or even DMs who might want to run a gauntlet? Okay. Well, uh, obviously level up. <laughs> you want to <laughs> be at your best. Um, I know people have been forming uh, what we like to call gauntlet boot camps. Hive Guild. I'm looking at you guys. Um, but basically... I would say get your character to the point that you feel like their story is completed. Don't feel like, oh, this is just a step so that I can be even better in my own campaign. It is, I'm going to say, 75 to 95% likely that you will die in the gauntlet. So if you have a story that you want your character to complete, I would complete that story and make sure that you feel like your character's kind of like done like, you could still play them, and they're still a good character that you enjoy playing, but that you don't really have more that you want that character to discover and explore. Um, aside from that, I don't know. Magic items don't hurt. Um, <laughs> don't Monty Hall it, and uh, don't house rule. We This is something that... Uh, Mike and I have talked about a lot is one of the things we want about the gauntlet, and this kind of also bleeds over to the DM part, is we're trying to showcase just what you can accomplish within the printed rules of Dungeons and Dragons, because it's very easy, like I do this all the time, where I will just kind of heavily modify a monster so that it's basically not what it is in the monster manual, and that's partly to make players not just metagame, but also at the same time it fits what I want to do better. But using the tools that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual, and now Volo's Guide to the Monsters just gave us a bunch, bunch of more stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that's really well thought out that never gets used. So one of the things I wanted to do with the Gauntlet in particular is showcase just how cool following the rules can be. So Singleton is made completely legally. His stats and powers and everything in him could be created with a build. Uh, all the monsters. There's not technically an undead frost giant. But there is an undead template you can There is an undead template. Yeah. And there's nothing in my gauntlet that's an invented monster. Probably the most invented part was the uh, ending with the skeletons falling from the ceiling. Hi. Um, that was Mike's idea. He <laughs> wow. <laughs> I blame him. Uh, but no. I can't keep track House of ruling ideas. is not inherently bad. But when you do homebrew a race or a class, balance becomes an issue. Um, and while in most campaigns I encourage homebrewing because that makes you feel more like you're playing what you want to play At this, uh, in, in the gauntlet we're trying to showcase just what you can accomplish within the rules so we prefer if you're not homebrewed like it doesn't rule you out we can talk with you about it I know uh, Gonthax Warrior Rage Totem I'm getting the exact name. The Phoenix Totem. Yes. Uh, that was not that's not a normal choice. That was a homebrew choice, but we talked it out and we didn't feel like it was too overpowered. It wasn't broken. It, it right. essentially is just an orc or a half orc. <laughs> yeah. Kind of no, it's, it is kind of. So um, only much more cinematic with fire. Right, with fire. But so well, that can't be broke. That might not be broken. Something as small as a mouse folk getting an extra five feet of movement can be. Yeah. Uh, I ran into an, a situation in one of the campaigns I played in where a mouse folk rogue 
was using that extra five feet of movement along with their disengage bonus action to essentially be untouchable unless they were charged at. Because uh, the person chasing them can only move 30 feet, and so they can disengage and then move, and they're outside of range of a move and attack. So the player had to basically charge, which only works if there's nothing in the way. We were in a forest at the time, so the mouse could just scurry behind a tree, and the other guy would just have to chase them and couldn't actually land a blow. So balance gets a lot who that harder. One guy was. Yeah, that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so balance can be a lot harder than it looks. Something as simple as saying, "Oh, they can move five feet faster," can have a lot of unforeseen consequences, particularly in the hands of a wily player. Um, and the person playing that outspoke folk was completely within their rights to do that. They've been given that power; they should use it. But when you get into a more competitive situation like the gauntlet, we have to look at house, house rules and homebrewing a lot more carefully just in case something like that shows up. Yeah, we, we don't want it to break the game or the... Because the challenge is fair, so the players need to be fair, question mark? Or, or uh, it should be in their own... Um, uh, in their own kind of uh, lane, I guess. Uh, so, uh, and also, by the way, if I can actually give one piece of advice for anybody who wants to be in a gauntlet, um, be wily. Yeah, no. Be wily. Outsmart the DM. Outsmart us. Yeah. Uh, he, I always respect a player who comes out with a genuinely clever way to get out of a situation that I assume was impossible. Yeah. I, I mean, the... It's how I give out inspiration. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's trying to, because you're in a gauntlet, you are competing to not only win a item, money, experience, the gauntlet, kind of, the, the reward that is I beat the gauntlet mm-hmm. and all the kind of, the group that's behind making it. Yeah. Um, but not only that, you also get... Kind of, you're, you are also surviving. <laughs> so if your character is in a survival setting, and if they're clever, and if they're wily, and so are you, there's no reason not to be. Right. Be clever, think outside the box. Um, One no meta. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't feel like you have to come up with unusually complicated solutions to straightforward problems either. That's something I've seen players do a lot. Not in the gauntlet, but just in campaigns. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes the simple answer is the right answer. But, yes, don't be afraid to think outside the box. Um, so, my last kind of two jokey questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I've been asked this, so I think it's fine asking sure. you this. Um, do, you, do you ever want to actually play in a gauntlet? Is that something that mm. you would ever actually want to do? I mean, you can. <laughs> want, want and should are two different yeah. words in this the, case. Oh, absolutely. Um, because as one of the co-founders and kind of the canon police, I guess. Oh, yeah, hard um, I'm the one who has to make sure that everything makes sense canonically. So I'm the one who knows the most about Singleton and what his actual goals are. Uh so me playing in the gauntlet does prevent pr- provide this inherent question where, well, what if, what what if I can use that knowledge to manipulate Singleton or something? I like have that? so much power. <laughs> I know so much. Others setting that setting that fact aside, um, I don't have a ton of characters because I'm one of those people who always seems to be DMing. Uh, I think my best character right now is a level three Kabold sorcerer. Uh, who's <laughs> who I've played like a couple sessions with and haven't touched since September. Um, it's been a busy semester. What can I say? Um, yeah, man. <laughs> so it would require a lot of work for me to get characters that I think would be gauntlet material. Um, and while I would love the challenge of a gauntlet, um, I don't know whether or not I would be good at it. That's fair. 
I, I mean, it, it, there is a level of you need to be an experienced player. Right. There, there has right. to be. No, that I there. definitely have far more experience DMing a session than playing. And that's a why. Session. And that's why guys like Justin Kim or even John Harrow. They they Harrow. both Har- Harrow Harrow. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they, but they both are players who uh, are experienced enough and creative enough yeah. to really, uh, really look at a challenge and um, kind of undergo that. Yes. So I, I, I think that there is that to be said. Actually, ignore my last question for a second. Do you, what is? Yes, this is always a weird conversation that mm-hmm. I know I've had with you. Is there a level? Is there a magic number you gotta hit? Cause we got level ones to sixes talking to me. Okay. And I'm I say below three. Below it, three, you're gonna be way too squishy. I'm sorry. It's. I bet you're a great character. You <laughs> have potential. Just train up a bit and come back and talk to us. Like I bet you're great. The issue you'll run into is. Some of these monsters are like level ten and above, and <laughs> while <laughs> while you can be the cleverest level one rogue, play, rogue, rogue. level one elven rogue. rogue, I get a thousand of them every day. <laughs> the cleverest level one elven rogue, whether you're drow, you're dual wielding, whatever you want to do, maybe you're a stealth rogue. You got archery going on. The fact main, it remains: you have. 20 hit points or less. <laughs> and some of these some do, of these things can do that in one hit. Like in a bite. <laughs> um and you're a calorie cookie. We don't intend for the gauntlet to simply auto kill everything. If that was the case, we just put a beholder in every room and that would be boring. Oh yeah, no, it, yeah. The the gauntlet is designed so that the party definitely has a chance. If there is a monster that seems undefeatable, there's a solution. So, the Frost Giant. It's a level 14 monster. They're a bunch of level 4s. They're not going to be that in a fight. But they didn't have to. They just had to get around it and past it across the cavern. You make that sound way (laughs) simpler. (laughs) I didn't say it was going to be easy. (laughs) But if they had taken a short rest, they could have easily done it. Oh, there's still... That one was mean. I'm sorry, guys. There's still bitter. Um, <laughs> now, now, the, uh, the, the other question that I kind of, I'm, I, I'm, I'm wondering here too, kind of to follow up on that a mm-hmm. little bit, is just, so I guess the level has to be around, like, for instance, your level fours mm-hmm. did very well. Yes. Way better than I know I expected. Yes. Um, yeah, me too. But I, I say part of that might have been they came together like the Avengers. And oh, no. They, there was definitely an Avengers initiative going on there. Oh, yeah. And do you... Just with, like, a sketchier Nick Fury somehow. Uh, how am I sketchier? <laughs> No, Singleton. Oh, I was about to... You're looking at me. I'm like, yes, I do go up to people like, hi, do you want to buy some death sticks? Um, <laughs> wow, there's an old reference to a bad movie. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so, the, uh, the question I have also is just, with these level fours mm-hmm. doing so well, do you think in the future... Because we haven't really seen this yet. Right. When we actually get a character who is maniacal mm-hmm. or who is a illithid level villain of some kind, mm-hmm. how do you think that's going to play into the actual party dynamic? Oh, the party dynamic will vary di- like greatly depending on what party you have. This party happened to have three players who have at least played in the same campaign. I know... Justin and John have played extensively in the same campaign together. Ash jumped uh, around. Ash jumped around. He was in there for a little while. And uh, John Harrow, John Spencer, was the person who was not in that campaign. I just realized there were two Johns. And yeah. Bob had to clarify. But no, Gonthak and Crix were old buddies. Um, so that immediately made it a very cohesive group. Um, this isn't really a spoiler. But the next party, 
they don't all work together as well. They're from different viewpoints. You got some evil people in there, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> no. There were no evil people? I mean, they're all chaotic. Okay, well, there you go. They, yeah. were, they were all <laughs> chaotic, and I think that was enough. Fair enough. Um, but, so that is not a given. You could potentially get into a situation where the party fights themselves. And that'll be fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. No, it's... And whatever a DM and a gauntlet throws at you... I, I think... I can't stress this enough. Mm -hmm. We do not just do monster encounters. No. Monsters are there. Yes. But traps and status traps effects... Traps and puzzles and, and hazards. And, and status effects. Hazards and, and mysteries. All the bad things. And, yeah, no, we are, <laughs> we are trying to explore the different depths of... 5e D D. Yep. so you are going to be given things that you probably didn't think about like to to be straight up you might have a character who is level 12 and has all the things and is has beaten multiple campaigns smited tons of terrible things and i respect you and we will adjust accordingly um <laughs> i <laughs> The gala is designed to be challenging but fair. We want it to be powerful enough that you don't breathe through it no matter who you are, but not so unforgiving that a party level fours can't make it past the first encounter. So in that respect, it is kind of in flux as to how dangerous a given gauntlet is depending on the party that encounters it. Um, we like to keep them around the same level, which I will not specify. Yeah. Um, but we are trying to make a dramatic adventure that's fascinating to listen to and to play. So there is a certain level of balancing that will be done to make sure that whatever party we get... They have a fun time. You know, or, you know, or a not fun time, depending on how things go. Uh, depending how you look at it. Um, and kind of, finally, mm -hmm. um, Alaric, mm -hmm. favorite monster, favorite race? Favorite monster, favorite race. To play? Uh, favorite race to play, favorite monster to DM with. Okay. this is. I see why this is a joke question. Um, let's see. Favorite monster. I have always been partial to kind of the wackier monsters. You don't say. Um, and while it's hard to pinpoint a single one, I like to pull out the monsters that people completely forget about. Things like Nothix, where it's just this, this gibbering thing with a giant eye. But it also knows your deepest, darkest secrets and can tell everyone. I had... I, I, I did one one-shot where I actually did use an Othic. And it was totally based off of what Alaric had used with an Othic previously. And mm -hmm. I thought it was too much fun not to play Oh, no. There, there's a lot of... If you read through the Monsters Manual, you'll find the classic monsters. You'll find your dragons, your griffins, your uh, gel gelatinous cubes. They're in there, and they're great. But you also find these bizarre monsters that no one ever uses. What was the last time you've seen a Bahir in an adventure? They're this 20-legged lightning lizard awesome. that climbs on walls and hunt dragons. Sweet, bro. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, it's... It... There's, there's just all these monsters that you don't see, and so I like to use them. Um, picking a single one is difficult, so I will evade that question All right. um as for a race this is gonna get me a lot of flack but i am always partial to kobolds <laughs> um they are the comic relief of the D, D world so the few times i do play playing a kobold is a great way for me to kind of challenge myself they're an official race now they are an official race now 
Also, one of the only races to still get debuffs in 5e. I, I think, noticed that, I, Wizards. I'm okay with that. I, <laughs> it's deserved, but I noticed that. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, yeah. Like, it, okay. I, I'm going to let you continue on Kabolds, but I need to preface something about Kabolds. Oh, no. Their, their whole point is that they die a lot. Yeah. Yes, I am very much aware of that. I, I, between what I've played in your campaign, mm -hmm. uh, which 3.5. Yes, I'm an old school DM. Yeah. I'm an old man who's set in my ways. That's fine. <laughs> uh, between your campaign, a campaign I played with Dan, a pl camp pl uh, campaign I played back home, mm -hmm. DMs <laughs> seem to like to slaughter kobolds <laughs> by the Like, it's... It's intense! I, I don't know what to say. I think that's why I like playing them. Because when you are a DM, they are a monster that you can just throw at the party in droves and not worry about. So the idea of one of those kabolds, who could be any of those kabolds that have died in the droves, becoming a powerful character appeals to me. Um, in your own words, the Alexander the Great of kabolds? Sure, I mean, <laughs> yeah, one could become that. <laughs> Is that the dream? Sure. To have that kabold? Sure. All right. I uh, haven't gotten close yet. Oh, no. But. I mean, do do you actually want to seek out playing more sessions? I mean, I'm definitely hoping to get more involved with playing. Uh this is just real talk. I have very little time. Yeah, no, it's uh, fine. But, yes. No, I am looking to get involved with some campaigns and play some more parties. I was hoping to get involved with the guild, actually. And not even as a kobold. Um, what? No. That's my favorite race, but sometimes a character idea works in such a way that the race and the class just fit together. Yeah. Um... The character I was thinking about trying out for the guild is actually a tabaxi because the guild, regardless of whatever mega corp they are now, was originally <laughs> the, the tabaxi bros. Yeah. Um, and so I was invited to join that and I had the idea of playing a pacifist cleric yeah. um, who would not really fight but would just be buffing and healing the party. And... That would work best when the party already liked the character. So, playing a tabaxi in the tabaxi bros would work with that character idea. No, it would work better than just having a party of right, right. rather than you all violent meet, men, you all meet in a tavern, <laughs> and ladies. Oh, I'm not gonna fight anyone. You guys go ahead and do that. I'm, yeah. I'll fill you up afterwards. But I'm not gonna fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that yeah. some disrespect. No, I mean, just uh, and uh, another tangent. Yes. The Vols, the Vols Monster Guide uh, races, I personally really did. Well, you've well, always told me how you get tired of the classic Lord of the Rings races. I, I no, I do get bored, and I and I like having something new because if I wasn't going to be a Tabaxi, I would have mm -hmm. been a Trident, and if I wasn't going to be a Trident, I would have been Goliath. If I'm not going to be Goliath, and I'm going to be the weird other peaceful Goliath thing, the Furbolg or something. Furbolgs, yeah. Yeah. And if I wasn't going to be that, then I might even go Orc or Bugbear or Kabolt. Like, I'm not doing... Mm -hmm. I, I hate the idea of just, like, I'm a human. And if I am a human, I'm going to be a weird human. Like, there has to be <laughs> there has to be something that makes it interesting. Sure. For me. Sure. No, I mean... Not saying elves are boring. There's, there's a yes and no to that statement, in my opinion, as a DM. Yeah. The Vol's Guide for Monsters makes my job the DM definitely harder. Yeah. Because when you have people playing these races that in the racist undertones of Dungeons and Dragons are almost always evil, it makes building the world a lot harder because you have to figure out the reason or the shift that's happened that makes these races not hunted on site. So while it's great to see D&D &D becoming more progressive, I guess? Question mark. Question mark. <laughs> um, it definitely makes developing cities harder. We ran into that same thing with uh, the Trump from 3.5 to 4, where you had 
tieflings and dragonborn as playable races. Those were very rare creatures in 3.5. Yeah. Now they're kind of one of the classic races, so worlds kind of have to be rewritten to make sense that lizard dragon people and oh, yeah. people descended from demons can be seen around cities. I, I mean, I, I know for a fact that like tieflings and uh, dragonborn, dragonborn especially, have become way popular. Yes, in a lot dragonborn of- are popular because who doesn't want to be a dragon? And oh, no, I sense. get that, yeah. I mean, I, I, when, I'm four, when 4E came out, I made a Dragonborn uh, Paladin. He, he got wrecked. Um, <laughs> by Scarecrows. Wow, wow. <laughs> Evil animated Scarecrows. It wasn't my fault. It's okay. <laughs> I've used Scarecrows before. Scarecrows are fun. I used one, and I realized I should have had more. Um, yeah, no, you want more than one Scarecrow. Oh, yeah. I, I, I had a good creep factor, though. Oh, yeah, no, it was a, it was a Halloween-themed session. They... They surrounded the barn we were sleeping in. Oh no, more holiday sessions for sure. <laughs> I'm gonna have my party fight Krampus. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's that uh, shows you how long ago we filmed. Yeah, this, by the way. we're not near Christmas. <laughs> Shush. Um, it's not finals week. Be quiet. No. Um, I I've, I love dating myself on these. I don't know why. <laughs> it makes people are just like they were sitting on this for months. <laughs> they could have released it anytime they wanted. Um, and we could have, and we didn't, probably. Uh, <laughs> it might be summer for all I know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the kind of with the monster, mm-hmm. uh, races kind of thing, do you think that it is, <sighs> for DM, mm-hmm. is there a kind of, is there a preferable kind of uh, class or race that is easier to DM? Because I know, at least for me anyway, I love playing Magic Casters. Mm-hmm. I hate DMing Magic Casters. <laughs> because, be, spell Casters. Because mm-hmm. they, 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 playing it, mm-hmm. you're a, a great sorcerer, broken warlock. Ooh. Uh, Ooh, wizard of fired. some kind. Shots well, fired. But, and you're that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, though, you have to, like, even with magic items, you have to deliberate and talk about uh, how these different uh, spells work and Uh figure it out. Because no one, especially early on, doesn't have all their spells managed or mastered or Mm -hmm. figured out. Um, I know I didn't for the longest time. Yeah. Now, now I really know what uh, my one character can do, and it's <laughs> horses. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna say 3.5 is better because it's definitely broken on some things. Um, looking at you, Mister Horse, I, I summon a horse for two hours per level, and just a horse that's there. I just make a horse. You guys have no idea what you can do with that. It's a first level spell too. <laughs> <laughs> just have a horse anytime. <laughs> a monster's coming at you. How about put a horse there, friend? <laughs> so, yes, spells provide a lot more tools. I'm also a person who likes to play spellcasters because it gives me a feeling that I have options almost all the time. Yeah. Um. Um. But at the same time. As a DM, you have to know what you're doing a lot better. You either have to have spent time, not really pouring over, but like getting familiar with a lot of the classic spells, or just be willing to have things go ways you don't expect them to, which is a good trait for DMs to have in general. D&D teaches you how to improvise, whether you're a player or a DM, especially if you're a DM, you know how to improvise a lot better. (laughs) Um, So that's not a bad thing. It is definitely more complicated to play or DM for a magic user, whether they're a cleric, a druid, a warlock, totem shaman, a spell slinger, a warlock. I said that one already. Forget, eh, Forget it. Oh, there's um, a lot of warlocks. <laughs> um, there's no reason not to have a lot of warlocks. Then if your party's all just fighters and thieves and rangers... Um, personally, I find the hardest thing to balance is summoner type characters. Oh. If you have someone who summons a lot of 
undead if they're a cleric or just summons monsters a lot if they're a wizard, that can get difficult to manage. Uh, one of the characters from my old campaign back in high school, their go-to move was called Flanking Spiders. Uh, basically they'd summon these level 1 spiders and just drop them behind each and every one of the enemies. In 3.5, that means you get a flanking bonus automatically just because there's something on the other side of them. I think in 5e, it might give you advantage. Yeah. Uh, so he just summoned monsters expressly for the purpose of giving advantage to the I'm other players. I'm glad to know that this curse of players just summoning things you don't want <laughs> is carrying on through horses. I mean, frankly, the horses are much easier to deal with. Than Probably, the yeah. Oh, no. because because the spiders, I can't even... really just make a horse behind it and go attack said horse. No, it's, 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 it's a just buffer a horse. Zone. It's a buffer zone for me. <laughs> if it's too close, make a horse. Sure. And and admittedly, this character was like level 10 at this point, so he could summon oh, yeah. a lot of them, enough yeah. to make it actually effective. If you summon one, that's easier to deal with. Uh, but if you're like, if you go to move your necromancer, you summon a lot of undead things. Undead are really powerful minions like they have a lot of hit points and their resistances are pretty strong so they're not helpful in a chase but in a straight up fight they can they can do some damage yeah so is there actually since i did play a favorite race and uh monster Mm. is there a favorite class favorite class oof to play or to dm for either or okay um I mean, I do like playing magic users. Yeah, man. So either a wizard or a cleric is probably the best for me. Um, I don't like warlocks and sorcerers as much simply because they have a smaller move set in that they're, their whole thing is that they're versatile, so they don't have to plan out their moves as much. Um, as someone who likes planning out their moves... I prefer being a wizard or a cleric because I'll have more options. I just have to know which ones I want. Yeah. Whereas a sorcerer or a warlock, you have a couple moves that you're like, yes, I always want this move. So while that's definitely easier and probably might be better in the long run in a lot of situations, just because you'll always be consistent, you won't be like, oh, I spent all my time... uh, getting detect magic spells because we're going into this magic archive. Oh, wait, there's a monster. Ah. Yeah. Um, I like having to manage my spells properly and plan out my moveset. And if you can do that, they, they are very powerful classes. So I prefer your classic spellcasters. Yeah. If I'm going to be a fighter type, I do prefer ranger, though, just because I don't like getting into a prolonged melee. Do you like that companion? When I played a lot of rangers, they didn't really get companions. Oh, okay. I played 3.5 rangers. They got companions at, like, level 6. Um, the animal companion's certainly nice. Like, as a ranger now, I wouldn't say no to it. Um, they did get the update. They did get the update, yeah, no. Well, I mean, that's... Again, that's because... And uh, I forget who it was, but one of the... People who wrote the Volos guy or not the Volos guy, the Unarched Arcana, did a little like page long blurb about why they updated the Ranger class. And basically, the Ranger class was designed to be the archery and dual wielding class. It was like the fighter swashbuckler type who was dancing around in a fight. But that's kind of shifted over to the rogue. So Ranger's kind of been left in this I kind of do this and I kind of do that. I'm sort of a druid, I'm sort of a fighter, I'm sort of a rogue, but not really any of them. So they were trying to give Ranger a identity of its own. They kind of made it more like a uh, hunter. A hunter from World of Warcraft, yeah. So they're much more focused on the animals and on picking a single target to take down quickly. Uh, and they can do some insane amounts of damage. Looking at you, Grimjaw, Strongjaw. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, so... They definitely have a, a place. I haven't decided whether or not they're balanced yet. Uh, <laughs> but Wizard says they are, so I'm not going to say no to a ranger that wants to play the new variant. Uh, I just personally may decide that 
they are unbalanced. That's just something. I've, I haven't played with enough Rangers to really decide yeah, that yet. If they're unbalanced, throw a bigger monster at them. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, there's ways to fix everything. I know Mike <laughs> thinks Warlocks are unbalanced. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, cantrips are broken. Cantrips are in every class. Mm, well, not like, okay, my, my biggest issue <laughs> is with, like, Mage Hand and Eldritch Blast mm-hmm. being cantrips. Because Eldritch Blast is... I, I realize that playing a Warlock, why do anything else? Oh, sure, no. I mean, this automatic, like, hits. Not automatic, but right. hits that get stronger every level. Mm-hmm. That's a huge blast of energy from your hand. Sure. Moreover than that, then you have Mage Hand, which I know... Some of the warlocks I know out there mm-hmm. who play warlocks don't really, and maybe this is me playing in your three point five talk. Sure, mage hand can be used to some good guys. <laughs> like it's it's not like I know we kind of say oh it's only like what five pounds ten pounds. I mean in five e it's powerful enough to push open a door. Yeah, so, it's, so it's, it's definitely a more useful spell now as a cantrip than it ever was before. When it had limited uses, the force is a is <laughs> is a serious yeah, thing. Yeah, it's basically telekinesis. Yeah, um, with with reasonable limits. Yeah, um, I, I'm just saying as a cantrip for me anyway. Oh, sure. I kind of see that, and I'm just like, ah, oh, man, if you're a creative player, if you yeah. know what you're doing, then that could get broken quick. Yes, and and when you're playing against a warlock as a DM, not against, but like <laughs> DMing for a warlock against a warlock. <laughs> There no, I know. For a world, I know. There are there's there's a, there's a balance to that though, in my opinion, because they do have a certain set amount of moves, and those certain set amount of moves are powerful, except when they're not, and then they really don't have anything. So that's hard because if you do that, you really just made your warlock player mad because now they get to not really be effective for a whole fight because yeah. you designed it to be against them. And so in that regard, maybe a Warlock is unbalanced in that they're either really powerful or really not powerful. Yeah. Um, and they don't get that many spell slots. To no, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's they what, get, that's they what get a select few moves that they use a lot. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's why it's kind of like, well, you're always saving those bigger spells, so you're always going to Eldritch Blast. Um, oh, sure. And if you're a warlock who doesn't use Eldritch Blast, I respect you. Oh, sure. Um, because <laughs> you decided to take the harder road. <laughs> um, and that, for me, I, I respect that a little bit more than just, you know. Oh, side tangent on the warlock. Yeah. Um, another reason I think it's easy for people to come off that warlocks are overpowered is because the way the class is designed, the backstory of your class is... You made a bad decision to get powerful quickly. Yeah. So it makes sense that your character is a powerful character. Uh, but there is built into your choice of class somewhere along the line where it goes bad for you. And if your DM decides not to bring that up, you did really just become a powerful character for kind of no disadvantage. Um, so, hey, DMs out there, if you have a warlock, think about how you can make them regret being a warlock, but not make them not having fun. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, you, you can definitely play up the fact that, like, you're patron of whatever, whatever. Because, sure. like, um, kind of quick shout out to Duncan. <laughs> he, his warlock, uh, Aigiko or Akiko or what, a very weeaboo name that Oof. I don't care for or know or remember. Um, ever and I've played multiple sessions with this character. It's a great character. Forget the name. Uh, she's evil warlock lady, mm-hmm. but his character uh, is. Uh, they do. He does make reference and tries to bring up the fact that she is working for a very maniacal patron, and she mm-hmm. did make a deal with the devil that could really bite her. Yeah. Uh, in the end, and I, I and I haven't. It, usually, when you see a warlock, it's just like I'm a really b- eldritch blast. I'm so powerful, and <laughs> it, it was actually very refreshing to just be like, oh yeah, no, my my patron could like snap, like wipe me out any second now. <laughs> like that's that's a serious threat. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I kind of preferred that. Oh, sure. I mean, like, the Warlock in 3.5 was a source book class. Yeah. Um, which means it was less heavily, like, thought about and balanced than other classes. Not, not to say they didn't think about it or balance it, but, like, it's been through less tests than classes like the Ranger or the Paladin or the Sorcerers have. Yeah. Um, so, I think the 5th edition Warlock is actually much better than the 4th edition Warlock, where it actually became an original class for the first time. The 4th edition Warlock, they kind of just were a... They just kind of did ranged sneak attacks all the time. And if you are a person who can consistently do ranged sneak attacks, it's kind of not fair. <laughs> it gets broken. Um, but again... They are built with this idea that eventually this power that they got comes with a heavier price than they're currently paying. Yeah. So it is a class that requires the DM to kind of think about where they want to take their story. Or you cannot, and the person just has fun being a warlock. I don't think a warlock will feel cheated if they don't have <laughs> things go horrible for them. Um, but if you as a DM feel like your warlock is broken... Or running a mock, or there's, there's your answer. Or just if don't, you don't have a just story don't be mean about it. Yeah, no. If you don't have like a, a, a storyline, yeah, of no, that's up. that's a great way to build a campaign. It's yeah, a great campaign arc right there. Yeah. Um. As for my favorite class, I think I said that already. Kinda. Yeah. Cleric something. Cleric, clerics and oh, wizards. wizards. Yeah. Um, preference towards the wizard, but that's just because. Most people don't play wizards. Wizard. I see more clerics being played than wizards. Uh, yeah. Not in five e. Five e clerics are an under underrepresented group. What in in five e wizards? No clerics. Clerics. Yes. No. They're no. <laughs> you they're, never see clerics anymore. It's always the druids. It's I mean, all about the druids. Actually, I've seen clerics. They're just multi-classed. <laughs> okay. Where people are yes. basically people don't want to be. I know this sounds bad. People don't want to be a cleric, but they will multi-class a level to in cleric to get the benefits that come oh, with sure. being a cleric. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, it's nice to be the healer, but you don't want to just be the healer. I don't know. It's nice to have healing spells. Right, yes. Um, especially when you are Swiss cheese after yes. a big old fight. You know? Yeah, no. Um, I mean, it, it, it makes complete sense. In... In game, not as much in character, and that's and that's why that's also why multi-classing is always hard in character. Oh yes, <laughs> uh, I am suddenly good at healing. Um, but the uh, it makes sense when you look at the character like five levels later. Yeah, no, I, I mean it's 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 uh, it, it's funny just because of with clerics you see like you see barbarians and warlocks now a lot, mm -hmm. and you see a lot of rangers because of the update. Sure. Um, and they, you know, they run into a fight, and let's say they get kicked, like yeah. just ripped apart, mm -hmm. and they're looking around like, do you have healing spells? I don't have healing spells. Do you have healing spells? I'm a barbarian. Why would I have a healing spell? <laughs> do you have healing spells? And, and there's like this lack of, and then the greatest debate, which is to or to not take a short rest, because that's what you got. <laughs> um, I mean, it is nice of D and D and Wizards of the Coast to make healing up without clerics a possibility. Back in the olden days, it was eight hours heals one hit point. Whew! You basically needed to have a cleric if you wanted to not sleep for twenty days after every fight. And there are some characters of mine that'd be okay with that. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, one last uh, yes or no question. Sure. Um, Alaric, mm -hmm. should we take a short rest? No. No? It's finals week. No? <laughs> There's no time for a short no, rest. No, always take it's a short finals rest. finals week. Oh, should, should the party take a should short we, rest? Should we take a short rest? I mean, it's up to you. Oh, that is so dumb <laughs> and sinister. You can if you think you're safe for an hour. That's mean. It's just it's just the fact of the matter. I think, honestly, the Bastion of Freedom Party made the right choice to not take a short rest. That hobgoblin ran away. He has friends. They was, could go and get this more was of a them. yes or no question, <laughs> sir. <laughs> it's yes with an asterisk. 
Of course it is. <laughs> I'm a DM. Are you excited to give no, a straight answer? I was answer hoping that? for a straight answer. I got really excited. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Alaric, oh, for sure. answering questions. Anytime. Um, and uh, I will. You will hear us in the next gauntlet, probably. Uh, uh, yeah, vaguely. Whenever Minorly. that comes out, whichever one it comes out, I bet it will be great. Um, Is there any coming on J term? I mean, there are a bunch. All right. I will see you guys later. Bye bye. Right.